Hello and welcome to the second of Peter Cook's lectures and uh, welcome to the bar for those who are not from here. Uh, I'm Marcus Cruz, I'm the director of the school and I'm just saying a few words before Peter kicks off in this lecture. It's actually going to be an interesting event. It's a, it's a, it's a typical Peter Cook event. I called him yesterday and I heard from, the, from Michelle Lukens who was organizing it that there was a, a different schedule, a different idea for this, uh, for this talk. So I called Peter and said, what is your thought? He said, I'm not exactly sure, but I think I give a talk first, then we have lunch, which is good, because otherwise we're sort of all hungry, and then we talk about questions and, 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 and just sort of brainstorm about what I present later on uh, in, in the afternoon. He said, okay, and, uh, and Peter was very keen on having Mark Cousins here, which is amazing, from the AA, to join the conversations later on. Uh, now, just uh, a few words about, obviously not who Peter is, who I guess it's sort of obvious, but the fact that I, I saw Peter for the first time in giving a talk in 93 uh, in Barcelona. I was a sort of foreign student there, and Ignacy Solo Morales was running this master's course in this lecture series, and it was in the Santa Monica Center on the top level with these beautiful views over the old town of Barcelona. And there was this sort of grand figure in his white, almost lap coat at the time, I'm not sure whether he still had this jacket, and blue glasses giving a talk. And I, I was coming from the Iberian sort of context and was utterly sort of puzzled, fascinated, intrigued by this presentation because it was something of a completely different uh, remit. It, was, it had a different dimension somehow altogether. And I thought, well, who knows, maybe I, one day we'll have the opportunity to cross the path of this man who is just sort of incredible and on the level of, of inspiration for people that I have never, have never seen before. And indeed, five years later, I came to do a master's at the Bartlett and Peter was running his master's and, and we became then friends since. And the reason why I'm here is basically because of the uh, involved me in teaching, and as he has done with so many people throughout his life, he has given others the opportunity to do things, which is incredible. Um, now, obviously Peter is amazingly known for his period in Archibram and the, the work he has done with uh, Christine Pauli, the Consul Scrats he did with uh, Colin Fournier, and his endless collaborations with others, and recently with his office Crab. Uh, and I, I think one of the great things is that Peter loves working with others, uh, but always has done his own work as well. Now what I think distinguishes Peter from all others is that when he speaks, he communicates like nobody else. There's a capacity to sort of touch a nerve of each person who listens to him, which I think is incredibly unique and it's in a way a great, great privilege that we have this series of four talks that Peter's giving here when sort of basically everybody in the world is sort of trying to get him over to give a talk. The thing that Peter also is able to do is not only to talk about his own work or comment on other people's work, his ability to talk about the work he hates or sort of the intellectual enemies he has. And I just found out yesterday that this is sort of probably one of the main focuses of this lecture, which is very unusual because it's usually common that you hear people talking about what they are interested in. And, and, and they sort of, they reject the work of others or what others are, are interested in. But the fact that he is able to indulge in the work of others that he actually seriously sees as intellectual enemies for a long time, I think is fascinating. And, and, uh, and it's a sort of kick, uh, intellectual kick for all of us to think of where we are standing. And I, I, have, I must admit, I have seen people now, probably, times giving a talk and the reason why I still continue going to the talks is because every time I come, even if I have seen some of the images before, there's a new sort of impulse, there's a new sort of thought that I haven't, haven't really, it hasn't crossed my mind or maybe mildly it happened but it's good to be re reminded of or simply altogether there's a measured message of relentless commitment, fight and and also a clear decision of where Peter's standing. And I think I have learned from Peter to constantly, re constantly reevaluate where he is standing, where we as architects are standing when the scene around us is sort of changing. That means that we have our own convictions. But the, 
the scene around stimulates you, and then you people in the scene, there are you know, pieces of work, and you consider where, where you have been before, and what you have been talking about to others. Um, so I'm delighted that you're here, and that it's, it's, a, it's a second of the series of four. I, 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 I seriously uh, suggest you to come to the other ones, because I think the first lecture you gave was already probably puzzling for those who haven't seen Peter before when he talked about the romantic and sort of nostalgic and the relationship to the hometown and sort of funny things that I guess some people might, have, might need a, a few other lectures to understand. If today this is about the serious zone, this is going to be even more puzzling. I'm sure when you see lecture number three and number four, you will understand and get the full picture of what the, the sort of thoughts are that Peter having. So welcome and thanks a lot for joining us again. It should be sequential. It is 
better than the balance. It should be differential.
sophisticated and highly conscious set of obstacles and introductions to space. And actually that comes out of my early, very earliest form of training where we had to copy drawings or diagrams sometimes of Assyrian temples and Egyptian houses where the procedure beyond a certain stage in, 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 along the line uh, had very strong implications both uh, if you like functionally or symbolically and tectonically. And so it is no surprise in a way that Aldo Rossi who had many other virtues um, at certain points falls back towards that condition. I've lost the caption to this, it was part of the process over the last few days of assembling, but it doesn't matter, it will, it will do. I think it's I think it's the time. But I might be wrong. And I think it's from the thirties, but I might be wrong. Anyway, the point is about what you can do with balance, of course, um, if you are canny, but you have to be extremely canny, you can erect together a composition of buildings which balance out along an axis, where they appear at first sight to be part of the same language, but on closer examination have particularities. Uh, it so happens that the, the uh, characteristic of this set of buildings is for the more florid parts and the less florid parts, they are, in, in, in a loose sense, in character. But there are differences. Um, if I wanted to explore that wing of things, I think that um, Echo de Bazaar itself, the actual original one in Paris, um, produced some extraordinary projects which uh, depended upon axiality, which have also fascinated me for a long time, uh, to see the sort of almost um, bark like exercise, how many things you can get off an axis. How many more things you can get when you go at 45 degrees to that axis? When you go on the diagonal, and this is wonderful. It's not my purpose today to, to get into, in a sense, it's not my purpose today to get into the highly inventive. I think already the Beaux Arts stuff is fruitier and naughtier, <coughs> and the degree of expertise leads to a certain layer of pleasure. On the other hand, it does amuse me to, just before I drop the, the, the heroic balanced axial condition, uh, to take an example which amuses me because the detail is the very opposite of what you expect. I moved to Oslo, the Beagle of the Park, and I haven't shown you, I'm not really sure, probably a crappy down there, but it, it's a it um, But the detail of the Beagle and Park is a lot of writhing figures doing extremely um, sexy things with each other and, and, and modeled with, with a certain amount of uh, wonderful realism in the middle of a, a park which is usually about as cold as, as, as it is outside today. This combination of, of the northern time, the, the exotic figures that, that Beagle and and then laying it out in a kind of neo-fascist part is, is a pithy combination. Uh, and that's why I'm used to include it. But perhaps more intriguing is the effect of power money and influence upon creating a whole city of balance. And even today, where it's a fairly thriving town, Karlsruhe is, is fascinating, where you can move from the core of, of the geometric form, which is in fact, of course, the, the castle. Um, the gardens, the Stadtwald, and then into the city itself. And only you, you notice about two, you go about two or three or four streets in, and then the system starts to break down, and, and, and various people with department stores and other such things Incidentally, of course, it contains one of my favorite pieces of vegetated architecture, which is uh, not 
I suspect part of the original program was probably done some years later, which is part of the orange room where you have an external building which has no cover but is affected by the, the vegetation growing on that. It's one that I often use the lectures. Uh, that's by the way. In fact, Karlsruhe is this extraordinary imposition of a system. And I kind of love it more than I hate it. There is the architecture that has to be differential, and it's not difficult to go to the third right um, to find this. And it is interesting that differential architecture seems to behave very much in conjunction with the idea of the vertical. I don't know whether anyone has ever written about this, it's just as it seems to be very much part of the issue. Although the referential architecture, having worked on some projects for a while with um, HOK International, uh, who have quite a lot of, can do quite a lot of master plans, I realized that the, even the 20th, 21st century commercial practice is still, particularly there in America, is still in love with the echo of the are still in love with the idea of the axis. Look, uh, look at not only Washington, but look at Canary Wall. If you step out in Canary Wall, it's all the time doing what um, American cities did very adequately 50 or 100 years ago or more. I find that curious in a world that has changed so much. <coughs> I literally one day came out of one of the high rises in Canary Wall and looked to the right for a taxi. It felt as if I was in downtown St. Louis or some such. I literally, I'm not making this up, I actually went up and looked for a cab, expecting it to be yellow and driving quite inside. Such was the connotation of that architecture and that organization. And its use of public open space also is extremely important. There is the restrictive. Um, and it intrigues me that there is an overtone of this, which, uh, which if you were brought up in the English provinces, associates such an object with imprisonment or keeping a cheese. Uh, what is interesting on the other hand about the, the system, the organizational system, is that again, if it is applied at an urban scale, um, the opportunism of the United States in particular uh, demanded that each block started to be differently interpreted. So however dogmatic the, the overriding system, the instinct of entrepreneurship, the, the, the need to, 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 to make a buck in the space, led to, as we know, Extraordinary variations in its interpretation. And then, at a later stage, the American gridded city starts to be really quite intriguing at another scale. Is this because of its scale? Is it because of its absorption? Or is it because the people interpreting it um, very interestingly lost the plot? Well, we're not interested in that one. They just wanted to have the space to do something. Nonetheless, we do get the project. We get a certain scale of operation. Not city scale, but bigger than building scale. Where the imposition of orthodoxy it becomes in its, in its own right. Condition. And there is an example of this uh, produced, I think, by some graduates of the ALI. I carefully well, forgotten their names, but it's in NW5. If anybody knows the part of NW5, which is below Parliament Hill, um, sort of slightly to the west end of Kentish Town, there's a long, long, long rock which doesn't. 
included, but one realized that there was another Mies van der Rohe who was more interested in the appointment of the United States. And I repeat the, the two slides, I think, from the last lecture, because they have stuck in my memory, partly because they were said by my teacher. Mies is great. The core communicates. And that was Peter Smithson realizing that the close quarters of Peter Smithson had often quite a wry sense of humor. I'm not sure how. I've been fascinated by the phrase ever since, but I'm not sure how far to take it seriously. After all, the Smithson's first and major building was the Hans Stanton School, which is so clearly influenced by Miss Van der Rohe that it doesn't re require underscoring. Uh, nonetheless, there it is. Uh, this is great, but called communicates. But the Smithsons, I think, never really got around to being able to emulate the call. Uh, and it, it is arguable, and I was just thinking about this in the shower this morning, that um, this is great, but Paul communicates. And, and, and I wrote elsewhere when the Sterling exhibition came about. I wrote on the subject that my generation was, when we did love them, were aware of the coexistence of the Smithsons on one hand, and James Sterling on the other hand. And that Smithsons was the person you knew about from the provinces, and Sterling was the person you knew about in the sort of sub absolute chattering circles. And that Sterling was infinitely more interesting as a bloke, apart from the Christmas private life, and infinitely more, his buildings were infinitely more interesting even when they failed. My wife my, my often says you can't see what we go on about. And she hears other people, uh, particularly certain key Americans, banging on about how interesting Sterling was. He says, I can't see what we'll get up on that. You know? um, but to me, Sterling did communicate. Sterling is a sort of designer's architect. And I think that what is intriguing in terms of the reputation of the Smithsons in recent years is that the, most of the people that I'm going to be talking about, particularly the English way, uh, revere the Smithsons, particularly because they wrote books um, with titles like The Art Rhetoric. Uh, I'm not sure on close examination whether both their buildings do actually lack rhetoric or avoid rhetoric. Uh, I just think that they are sculpturally, uh, form formalistically, far less effective, far less interesting than the Sterling buildings. And I expect many people, even maybe many in this room, would not agree with me. But I would, I would maintain the fact that flawed though it was, and doing often building buildings with a a mannerism which I should not approve of by postmodernism. He was still a much, much more interesting designer, much more witty designer, much more inventive designer, much more his, his myth designer. Uh, and the Smithsons started to dive up their own assholes after a while. But Mies was there and was able to return. Germany as a hero. One of his mates, I'm not sure he really was a man, and uh, at least, again, from the point of view of private life, was certainly a fascinating guy. But um, I'm not sure about this pizza. Um, I don't know whether I'd like to meet him on a dark night. Uh, but he was, he was around, and, and, and it's, it's interesting that, that he was. Um, encouraged the United States <clears throat> with all the rest um, and made these extraordinary city projects which have remained, they remain in the brain. You can't see one of these drawings, even if it's a single line version, without being really frozen to see. I can't describe uh, who was able to say such things. The common block replaces the single house. The importance of collectivity overcomes the individual. Sounds like something out of a sort of Stalinist manifesto. Uh, and um, it, it has extraordinary.
true great dogmatism. I was looking around to see what else he did when he wasn't doing these dogmatic studies. And um, find there are a few little bits and pieces that are not that impressive. Or perhaps a more fascinating character, in a way, is Hannes Meyer, who was extremely politically driven and went at a certain point to Russia to, to try and build there. Uh, I think these three, I, I, I've done him the justice of three pictures because there's a picture of a serious man. There's a cartoon of a serious man as a politician. And there's him and a lady on the beach in their birthday suit, which I think is uh, also relevant, of a, I suspect, of a certain period. It's that, that, that sort of very in your face kind of German period. Um, and with a friend called Bitfer. Bit made some buildings, which are quite interesting in mechanisms. I've always been intrigued by the degree to which Charabi was, was admired, particularly by people like uh, uh, Peter Eisenman. Uh, I've never quite got it. I've never quite got it. Uh, is it where? Is it the acceptable place of fascist architecture? Is it a certain kind of elegance? But that's not what he was purporting to be about. I've never, I've just never got tyranny. But I know it. it's one of these terrible things you grow up knowing that certain people are intellectual. And, and reading that they're influential, and, and sometimes even going and listening to the lecture, and you come and say, Yeah, I suppose so, but I don't know. Maybe I'm sure there are people sitting in this room who know much more about Toronto than I do, and will explain to me in brief terms what he was about. There are other funny figures that, that, that are not only really serious, they're really positively sort of uh, operatically serious. and, and uh, I think this, this guy, I, I never knew about this guy until I had to work backwards and I, I, I found the projects first and then tried to find the places. And then this guy, but I'm sure, I'm sure he's out of bed. You know, I don't really take him seriously as, as, as an architectural person. Um, I'm sure he's out of bed, one of the bed stupid uh, librettos. But he did this building which, of course, is. The simple fascist architecture. And it certainly communicates, none, no doubt about its communication, and, and, and the backdrops to these conditions I find fascinating. Well, I, I, in, <coughs> in the group of places, you probably thought, who's that guy in the hat? Or um, indeed, he was in a hat, he was in a Nazi uniform. And of course, as we know, Speer, I think he even made it to the bunker. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I got out of the bunker, but I seem to remember reading something that he was in the bunker. A good Hitler, a good Hitler, suicide. And he was going to build this amazing version of Berlin, and there are whole pieces of Berlin where there are site reservations for enormous animals. And uh, there were also, so between the Italians and the Germans on the axis of the court during the Second World War, uh, there were a number of these often vertically emphasized buildings. And even people today who emulate them. Interesting character, I mean, often cited as a model for certain kinds of, of um, rationalist building. It is the long colonnade of the Stuttgart Railway Station. And, yes. and yet, the same architect did a, a fascinating uh, proto fruity building in, in Hamburg called the Chillenhaus. The same architect called 
could move to the groom and uh, in another building play with a rather difficult sight and turn it into magic. I now get people that I have actually encountered <coughs> in the flesh. Matthias Ogers was a very influential architect in Germany in, in the years probably between about uh, 70s and almost the end of the century. Uh, extremely influential. Also influential as a teacher. And we have to remember that, that um, Graham Kuhas chose to opt out of the a fifth year of the time, never opted out of people's influence, and, and deliberately went to study with Matthias Ungers in, in Cornell. And that there was, and I digress again, Ongoing battles, anyone who knew about Cornell and knew people, the constant battle between Colin Rowe and the Tears of the battle for hearts and minds, and people who had to park their car up the hill so they're not to be seen to be parked outside the enemy. Um, and I digress into a short anecdote, which is that Ron Herring and I gave a lecture with Mr. Ungers and Mr. Rowe and Mr. Candela and Mr. Swiss and all in the front row and we're shitting ourselves. Oh my God, what are we going to do? Um, but in fact, their main interest was a, a battle, not with us, but between the two of them as to which restaurant we would go. And this battle took up most of the evening's proceedings. They couldn't let go. Uh, I digress. Ungers actually uh, was a nice man and could be an honored one. So I digress again. But I think that the, the neo-fascist architects who cook for an omelette are put you into very difficult positions. Uh, do you, does the omelette taste differently? Or are they not really neo-fascists? I don't think he was a neo-fascist, but it, it's interesting because as a student from A on, on, on a travel graph, I saw an omelette building and photographed it, thinking, that's a good building, I wonder who did it. Very early on. Very early, Ulrich's house. And as he became more successful, he decided to be more orthodox. It's really, I find that fascinating, and I would suggest that Mr. Chippewa is, is going into the same mode. Very interesting. One could almost do half an hour on the subject of early Ulrich, late Ulrich, early Chippewa, late Chippewa. They're both going through the same. As they become, as they became, as 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 it became a bigger thing, <coughs> as he returned to the United States, not having built anything there, and returned to really, really large jobs, and, 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 for example, the uh, Frankfurt Messer, he he made his architecture more. Orthodox. I could even suggest that this is parallel to me when he was America. The building became, in a sense, formulaic. Reproductions of themselves, larger, larger scale. Intriguing. Um, as you can see, I have a sort of soft spot for him. Maybe because he made an omelette. Uh, and and I, I, I think that this. And uh, it was at the time when I was up for the professorship in in Frankfurt, and he could have blocked me. The politics was such that he could have blocked me. And on, after the armed evening, he, he didn't block me. I thought it was interesting. I don't know what story behind the story was being on that. But of course, one was affected by, by and this is why uh, Mark is here, <laughs> in a sense. One was affected by the psychology of the situation, and the personalities of the people. And why they choose to do what they do because some of them are talented enough to do almost anything. I think. I think many architects of talent, consciously or subconsciously, decide upon the territory in which they will perform. So here we have a Kuhas without colors. Still borrowing the grid and starting to make it, its, its interpretation even far more idiosyncratic than most Americans. 
Other than Rossi, I did not meet. I think I saw him once in the back of a room, but uh, people tell me he was an extremely nice man. Uh, and who am I to disagree with that? I was amused when he found it upon himself to, to make a project which wonderfully ignores the rest of the city. I'm no deep arch contextualist, but my God, it chooses to ignore the rest of the city. Um, another man I have not met, but I'm fascinated by, is Miroslav Sik. I'm told that he is, he is a very miserable guy. I'm told he's a very angry and miserable guy. He's from the Czech Republic, but finds himself as a professor in, in the city of And a drawing of his, which is piece on the left of the slide, I found it so, so fascinating. Actually, I don't know how to understand it. I think, oh, sorry guys, this is a, this is a, <clears throat> it's not meant to look like a collage. It's meant to have one picture on the left <laughs> and one picture on the right. If you can imagine, this is people that are playing that. Uh, if you can imagine the, me showing the first last stick when he builds his own drawing. But on the left, when he draws, is extremely, it can only be described as a sort of concentration camp in the Gothic. It looks like a concentration camp. Um, I think it's in my drawing book. Yeah, it's drawing. Uh, and it's, you wonder what goes on in the head of somebody who makes the patches face with this grim concentration camp. But then it's the point. And then, if you look closely at that slide, at the back of the drawing, it looks as if this is put in Central Park, New York, with the skyscraper there. Very strange. I was told that when I published Six Drawing, the book I did, uh, he was the most surprised person in Zurich. He said, but that awful big cook, why, why does he like my drawing? I do like his drawing. And again, I think it's a case of something in my position of talent who could go this way or that way. Not least can Hans Kohlhoff. Hans Kohlhoff, who as he gets older, gets grimmer. I remember him when he was quite young. He was quite chunky and he didn't look like that. And he, his stuff was fine. You know, as he became more successful, he well, and straighter. <coughs> Interesting case, Leo Crea. Leo Crea was around the A. Leo Crea was actually one of the teachers of Sartre Hadid, and she still says sometimes in a weak moment that actually she learned a lot from Leo Crea, and he was brought in to teach the play by, of all people, Elias Engelis. And um, that's an interesting conversation. He was, of course, notably, most disgustedly, um, a, a young, unqualified assistant in Sterling's office. And it is claimed by many that he influenced Sterling's work. The career drawing, I think, that I <coughs> used here is intriguing in that if you remember that Bonatz uh, Stuttgart railway station, the, the device of placing extremely long columns or a division or sometimes usually columns and then placing a single attic story with little square windows above it was used by many, many architects um, in the period around the 1970s. And I think. I'm not sure that Korea, well, Korea didn't invent Bonatz was doing it anyhow, and maybe Bonatz got it from somewhere else, but Korea drew it most clearly and, and it was able to be imitated. It was grim repetition, irrespective of what the brief would be, sometimes the brief would be. I know a case in Frankfurt where the brief is a Kunsthalle, uh, there are other briefs, there's even a sort of, sort of, sort of just down the street in, in Houston Road, uh, towards um, the top of Great Portland Street. You see on the left a grey building, which is a sort of tempered down version of the party. Another man who worked a long time for, for uh, Hoover's is 
Max Kudler. And sorry, I'm going to catch this one. It should be Max Kudler. It's Kudler like Kudler. T V T L. And his work is, in many ways, taking off where the tears are going to stop in the selection of the two pieces there. Or Roger Zina, who I haven't met, but must be a nice man, because his office sent me tickets to go to the Biennale. Uh, again, this friend. You will see that the, 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 the cynical observer that people don't really have any theories of people. But um, I assure you it's not completely true. I'm always, I, I, I once had a difficulty of giving a lecture in a room like this room. And in order to get into that, and, this isn't the truth, and in order to get into that room, you have to go through an exhibition room. And the exhibition room was, um, was full of dealer and dealer's models done in an extremely dual manner. I mean, they didn't really have windows on them. Some had a few some holes for the windows, but then there were about 10 of these models. And I had to get into the lecture. And it, it put you in a very strange frame of mind. I thought, my God, no wonder some of these Madrid architects are doing that, what they're doing, then it's my team and Dina. But I had to walk in and out through it. It's like sort of having a cold shower before you, <laughs> you know, done something. And Mr. Lampagnani, I think, a lot of these people, of course, as, as, as it's known, are hanging around the Etihad in Zurich. Uh, and I think that as a result of that, I built up in my mind, since I haven't been allowed to lecture there for 30 years, that the, the Etihad in Zurich contains so many of these people who do stuff I don't like. It must be interesting. You see, it's much more interesting than some boring little place. Sort of does all right stuff. It is quite fascinated by it. Because it's got all these pieces in it. They're all in each other's city, or they all in camp in the morning, or what. And then we come closer to home. There's Mr. Fred, looking extremely serious. Um, we had a very agreeable conversation about three weeks ago on the plane from Hamburg. And he does buildings, premises, which I don't know what it says about Britain if you do a building like that. What are you saying? Britain is steady, Britain is cheap, Britain is calm, Britain is about the same as Or Lavington and Macrida, who I notice if one goes online, have done a lot of buildings. I have a strong suspicion that they're doing one of those extremely grim buildings in the North End of the King's Cross Road. I, I, I try to quickly find out who is doing all those blocks. I, I, it must be documented somewhere. But my God, there's some grim stuff going on there. It has to be some of these buildings. It can only be. And I love how But my God, it's going to be Grimsville. It's, it, it, it reminds you of the cartoon in private time that says it's grim up in North London. Uh, and it's getting grimmer, guys. It's not getting any more amusing. Um, and a, a, a person I haven't had the pleasure of meeting, but I'm told it's much talked about. Who is obviously hard, hardcore, uh, certainly the work of his unit today is extremely hardcore. I find it hard to take, but again, one is sort of, one has a horrific fascination for it. Uh, and its diagrammatization uh, reminds me of Philip Glass on a bad day. Um, I was tempted to bring in some music response, but I thought it make the whole thing too long. I came to compare. A typical piece of Philip Glass um, with um, John Adams, where John Adams would be treated by Philip Glass as being a sort of renegade, whereas I find John Adams' music listenable to. And it's 
very interesting when you read John Adams' autobiography, where he was insisted upon by his teachers at Harvard to do a certain kind of minimalism, with which he remained fascinated, but only for a while. As soon as he really gets going to start getting his own noise, he goes off on a tangent. So, is this, this is the architecture produced by oh, uh, Mr. Arelli and his group Dogma, is it the new bleakness? Is it bleaker than bleak? And as the stock market descends and the temperature cools, and we're still only in mid-January, is that what we have to face? Or is it that? Or is it that? Or might it conceivably be these? Or would it be imposed upon me? That is for families. And I guess you could argue they get a peek through to the next block.
uh, reading about this Victorian England, which already to me was, was something else, on the front line. And it was a massacre. It was a battle. It's funny now. There are, I think, there are extreme battles there, but it's not polite to talk about it. I, I, I haven't had a really good argument with anybody on an architectural issue in England for a very long time. Okay, or today, who knows? But um, those guys really got it together. I mean, of course, there were, there were tragedies and, and, and intriguing things, such as you know, the fact that poor old Putin worked his ass off and was, was maneuvered by Barry. Paid a few bars and, and, and made the building more interesting. Uh, and, and I guess all of us had to do stuff for money or something. So not one of us. But is this the ideal state and deliberately chosen to finish on something that might be architecture, might not be architecture, but suggests? whatever it might be, seriously. Uh, I was telling you, we started three, uh, uh, yeah. a discussion.